uh, and I also have a connection with him. He was the first person that uh, my first REU experience. He was in charge of it. And he, you know, we didn't know until today in the afternoon in the middle of the meeting <laughs> that I realized that was him. I was like, oh, I remember you. Um, <laughs> was that guy? Yeah, it was a strange connection. But, uh, anyway, so thank you for coming. And uh, to take you your appreciation here. Here's your laser with your name on it. So you'll be forever connected to Tamu. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell a story, the story of uh, how we transformed the way we teach physics courses. Hi. Oh, is there a volume control? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 how's that? Better. Okay. Okay, now I can talk in a natural voice. Okay, so... Um, Boulder, Colorado is the site of the University of Colorado, which is an institution very much like this one. Um, it's uh, nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, a little, we're a little greener, uh, um, but we're about the same size, 31,000 students. It's a, large, uh, it's a large physics department, 55 faculty, 350 undergraduates. Um, majors, 230 graduate students. Um, we're a good department. Uh, our AMO group, Atomic, Molecular, and Optical group, is rated uh, first in the country, and we've generated three Nobel Prizes in physics in the last decade. Um, there's a sign outside the physics building, which we keep having to make bigger and bigger. <laughs> so the teaching load at CU is, uh, I'm sure, similar to here. Um, it's an R1 university. We choose faculty on the basis of their research promise, not their ability to teach. Uh, so the teaching load is one course per semester. Um, all the faculty rotate among as many courses as possible. Faculty are not allowed to settle into a course and own it. Few faculty, only about three out of the 55, are excused from teaching the big freshman courses. Professors teach the same course only two or three times before they're rotated out. The big freshman courses are taught by two faculty members, a veteran and apprentice team. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Assistant professors must teach a big freshman course before tenure. Among the 35 departments in the College of Arts and Sciences at CU Boulder, physics is ranked number one in research, but we are also ranked internally number one in teaching. So how do we do it? Um, Oh, another measure of our success is the number of physics majors nearly tripled since 2001. Uh, that's actually a problem. Our, our classrooms aren't big enough to hold our majors anymore. So we have a large and active physics education research group that does work on curriculum development, research about how people learn physics, how best to teach physics. Uh, the, the, our group leader is an excellent guy named Noah Finkelstein, um, Steve Pollack, and I, Kathy Perkins, Melissa Dancy. I have Carl Wyman in parentheses because he had to resign all his university positions when he accepted a job at the White House a few years ago. We have postdocs and graduate students and collaborations with several faculty from other departments. Um, also in the PER group is uh, the FET team. I'm actually a member of FET. FET stands for Physics Education Technology. Actually, it doesn't stand for that anymore. It's, it's a generic name doesn't stand for anything, but it's the best science education software money can buy, except you cannot buy it because it's free. How many of you have used FET Sims? Okay, this is bad. Uh, so uh, invite me back and I'll give you a talk about the FET software, but that's another story. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, so here is the issue that physics education research is trying to remedy. Um, here is a professor giving a beautifully clear lecture about looks like uh, the bell curve, Gaussian function. The students are seeing this for the first time and are trying with various stages of success to make sense of this. It's a beautifully clear lecture to the professor because he's been thinking about it for 30 years. But the students who are seeing it for the first time are trying to understand what the symbols on the board are. Some of them are trying to organize things and some kind of knowledge, and others have less uh, attention than the professor would like. <laughs> the problem with this picture is the professor cannot read the bubbles over the students' heads, and if he could, he would be surprised. So that's what the clickers help us do. It allows the professor to get feedback 
about what the students are thinking. But it also gives feedback the other way. It gives the students a reality check. Are they understanding what they're supposed to? So there have been a variety of um, classroom reforms. Sorry, I've got a boat going here. Hold on, let me uh, stop that. We started years ago by changing the way we teach freshman physics. Freshman physics used to be taught in a very traditional manner. The professor would stand at the blackboard for 50 minutes and fill the board with equations. And occasionally there would be a question or occasionally the professor would turn around and say, any questions? No? Good, let's move on. So <clears throat> first thing we did was introduce something called concept tests and peer instruction, which I'll show you in just a minute. Most important thing we did, and this is key, the most important thing we did was change the nature of the exams. We put conceptual questions on the exams. That was the only way to make students take conceptual understanding seriously. We introduced online homework. Uh, we changed the way we did office hours. We have something called the physics help room, which I'll describe later. We changed our TA-led recitations. We basically abolished our TA-led recitations and replaced them with something called the Washington Tutorials, using both graduate TAs and undergraduate TAs. Uh, we instituted standardized pre-post tests, not to establish a grade, but to establish how much the students were learning year to year. Uh, we introduced a veteran apprentice team teaching so that young assistant professors and others could be trained uh, to use uh, uh, interactive engagement techniques such as uh, clickers. Uh, we started using FET interactive simulations. And just recently, we started requiring the students to um, watch uh, a set of beautiful online pre-lectures developed at the University of Illinois. And I understand you had a colloquium recently by Matt Sellens who talked about that. Currently, all the freshman and sophomore classes have been transformed, and most, <clears throat> most of the junior and senior classes have been transformed. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the transformations at the upper division. Uh, that's another colloquium. You'll have to invite me back. Today, I'm going to concentrate on... You don't get an okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'll use the one I've got. Okay. So, uh, what's peer instruction? Well, in 1997, I got... Somebody stuck this book in my mailbox. I think it was the local sales rep. So, what's a clicker question? It's a question, a conceptual question, that uh, the professor asks the audience and the students vote with their clicker. But before they vote, they're supposed to confer with each other. They're supposed to engage in peer instruction. They're supposed to talk about the reasoning behind the answer to the question. We actually assign the students to small clicker groups. And I'm going to want to do that today. So I'm going to ask everyone to lean over and talk to a nearby person when it comes time for me to ask you questions. Because uh, not everyone has a clicker, but everyone is near someone with a clicker. OK, so let me uh, begin by asking a difficult, a difficult question. Let me begin by, excuse me, let me borrow this real quick. Let's make sure everyone's clicker is on. So hit the power button and hold it down until it starts flashing. Hold it down until it starts flashing. And then when you see it flashing like this, press A twice. Press A, A. You should get a string of green lights. OK, so everyone, everyone see a green power button on? OK, so here's the first question. Okay, I haven't started the question yet. You, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question before I allow you to vote. Here's the question: um, What letter am I thinking of? <laughs> okay, uh, it's not as hard as you think because you get to confer with your neighbors before voting. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna start the vote. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, <clears throat> just vote. Everyone hit a clicker button A through E. I can see 12 votes are in, 20 votes are in. Now, you can't see the results of the vote, but I can, because I've got, I've got um, a little feedback device here that tells me the spread in votes. OK? So when you vote, you'll see a green button flash. When you see the green button, you know for sure your vote got in, because there's a handshake between your vote gets in, the box records it and then sends back a signal to your clicker that gives you a green light. So if you see the green light, you know the vote is in. You can vote as many times as you like. It's only the last vote that matters. I'm going to stop the vote in three, two, one. There are 48 click, uh, uh, 50 clickers out there, I think, but only 48 votes. So uh, maybe I miscounted the clickers. Anyway, I'm stopping the, 
I'm stopping now, and let's show the results. So it's overwhelmingly for A, okay, and that is amazing because A was the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Proof positive that there is ESP, right? <laughs> okay. Now the great thing now. <clears throat> If you want audience feedback, you don't need this high-tech solution. You could just use colored cards. In fact, we used colored cards at University of Colorado for four years before clickers became affordable. And, you know, we just passed these out, and the, and the students would just, you know, do like this. But the problem with that is it's not anonymous, so you can't ask sensitive questions. Every once in a while, I'll ask the audience, how many of you are lost right now? And, you know, if it's anonymous, they have no trouble saying, I'm lost. But, you know, they'd be kind of shy about that. So let me ask you a sensitive question. Um, yeah, what's a sensitive question? <laughs> if you were to significantly increase your teaching efforts, how would this affect your salary? Uh, only faculty vote on this one, please. <laughs> so if, you, if, uh, if you're a graduate student, hand your clicker over to a faculty member. So I'm going to start the vote. Uh, let's vote quickly, please, because we've got a lot of clicker questions we have to get through. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Positively, negatively, no effect. I don't know or I don't care. Uh, I don't teach, so it's irrelevant. <laughs> okay. Thanks for, uh, thanks for pointing out that I didn't have any choices up there. Okay. All right, let's see how you voted. Oh, let me take a peek at the results as they come in. Nice Gaussian distribution here. Here are the results. I can show the results in real time. You can change the vote, and you'll see the results there. <laughs> How many don't teach? Okay. All righty. Let's see what's next. Um, so now I'm going to ask a real question. This is a physics question. This, this might have been a concept test. This happened to have been one of the questions on the midterm exam that I gave just last week. So I'm going to read the question. And before you vote, I want you to confer with neighbors. So here's the question. A small block of mass M, starting from rest, slides down a frictionless ramp to a round valley with radius of curvature R. At the bottom of the valley, point A, the mass has speed V. What is the magnitude of the acceleration of the mass when it is at point A? The choices are A, G, B, V squared over R, v squared over r plus g, v squared over r minus g, or none of these. The symbol g means the magnitude of the acceleration of gravity. So I'm going to start collecting votes now, but I want you to all confer with your neighbors and come to a consensus prior to voting. That's called peer instruction. Please discuss. I can see how many votes I can see how many votes have come in 36 and in practice I just let the discussion go on until most of the students have voted usually the students have all voted within one or two minutes so the discussion doesn't have to go on very long um, I can see the votes as they come in and so if there's an enormous misconception that is obvious from the votes I'll sometimes give them a hint and I'll say something like notice that you have to conserve energy uh, but I'm gonna stop the vote in three two one so make sure your vote is in you don't see the green light when you press. Your vote didn't get in, but I'm stopping now. Okay, so uh, we got a consensus, but not an overwhelming majority. <laughs> so um, at this point, if this was a real class, I would ask someone to defend their vote. Uh, but I, I'm pressed for time, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, B is the correct answer. Um, but by no means is this a uh, simple question. About 53% of the students voted correctly on my midterm exam number two, and they were all freshmen. But, you know, you're not all freshmen, so you did a little better, 65%. <laughs> 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 uh, 
65% is the correct answer. Okay. Students study for exams. So if you want students to worry about qualitative understanding, Put qualitative questions on the exams, exams that look like the concept tests I'm doing in class. So right now, uh, you get to vote on what kind of question uh, you want me to ask. Uh, do you want me to ask you, A, a question about static friction, B, a question about torque, C, a question about DC circuits? I only have time for one of them, so vote. Let me, uh, this is a survey, so there's no right answer. I'll just uh, display, whoops, sorry, back, sorry. I wanted to do this, okay. Uh, it's a tie between B and C. So someone give us a tiebreaker, please. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, D and E. You're, you're, D and E people. You're wasting your vote. So uh, don't waste your vote. Uh. All right. Looks like uh, C is A. Oh, okay. <laughs> B it is. All right. I'm stopping the vote now. Uh -huh. Okay, question about torque. All righty, here we go. Uh, that was the question about friction, but we're skipping that one. Here's the question about torque. Let me read it here. A toy car with mass M moves along a massless wooden plank lying horizontally over two support posts. The car is rolling across the bridge from point P2 to point P3, left to right. What can you say about the magnitude of the net torque, the sum of all the torques, about point P1? as the car travels from point P2 to point 3. Um, it's increasing, it's constant and zero, it's decreasing, it's constant and non-zero, or not enough information is given to answer the question. Please confer with your clicker teammates before voting because peer instruction really, really helps. I'm starting the voting now. <clears throat> Okay, I can tell already this question is too easy for this crowd because I'm getting 100% correct so far. So let me have the rest of the votes. See if I rush you. Will some of you vote wrong? Okay. Uh, I've only got 37 votes. I should be looking for 48. Let me have the rest of the votes, please. Three, two, one. Remember, if you vote wrong, there's no shame because I don't know who you are. <laughs> of course, in class, it's only anonymous in real time. All the students register their clicker. Every student at the University of Colorado owns a clicker, and they register on a, on a website. There's a unique ID on the back of the clicker. So later on, after class, I can find out who voted how. Okay, time's up. I'm stopping in three, two, one. Okay, before I show the results, is someone so confident in their answer they can defend it? They can tell me how they voted and why they voted the way they did? Anyone? <laughs> Way in the back, yellow, yellow green shirt. Sir, how'd you vote? You voted B. What is your reason? It's not moving. It's not angular torque. Is I alpha? Uh, you are uh, with the majority on this one. 84% uh, correct. Okay. Um, Real quickly, let me show you. This was the circuits question. Uh, how I've got three light bulbs in a simple DC circuit. How does the brightness of the light bulbs compare? Um, all three light bulbs are equally bright because they're in series, but boy, the engineers want to believe that A is brighter because it's getting hit by two batteries at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> Uh, if this was an ordinary school, unlike an excellent school like this one, I would be giving you a pitch about how simple technology works best. This campus has already chosen iClicker as the campus standard, so I don't have to tell you that uh, the more complicated a piece of uh, technology is, the less likely it is to function in battlefield conditions. Here's a complicated clicker that allows the student to enter text and numbers with units, and only problem with this kind of clicker is that um, it is too complicated for all faculty. 
The, the simple clicker you have in your hand, which has an on-off button and five choices, is too complicated for some faculty, <laughs> which is good enough. OK, at CU Boulder, 28,000 students currently have registered clickers. that are used in more than 200 courses in 20 departments. Clicker use started in 1997. That's a little inaccurate. Uh, concept tests, in 1997, we started using colored cards. And around 1999, we started using an infrared system, which was a nightmare as far as management and maintenance was concerned. Uh, just about five years ago, we switched to the radio frequency clickers, which is what you have in your hand right now. OK. Clickers are easy to use at CU because we've integrated the clicker ID into the student identification. Um, students go to a website and register their clicker exactly once for all courses for their, all, uh, their whole career. Faculty get the clicker roster right at the same page they get the class, class roster. Clicker use spread to other departments uh, largely, um, what's the word I want, um, endorsed or uh, pushed or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, co no, coercion is the wrong <laughs> word. <laughs> Uh, so, Nobel Pro facilitated, thank you, Nobel Prize winner Carl Wyman from the physics department started a science education initiative. And the purpose of the initiative was to um, reform science teaching across the college, not just in the department. And that was supported by the CU administration. It funded a lot of uh, education researchers, postdocs in various departments. And the result was most of uh, the science departments started using clickers and started using them in a big way. So the result is all the students own the clickers. And so there's a law, low activation energy for clicker adoption because no faculty member has to worry that, oh, gosh, this is another expense for my students. They already own them. They already have them registered. Now, clickers are a tool. And like a knife, it can be used very, very well or very, very badly. Some poor use of clickers are solely for taking attendance, for quizzes and high stake, stakes testing, only occasionally at set times. I couldn't believe it when someone told me someone in the chemistry department was giving two clicker questions every lecture, one at the beginning to make sure they were there on time, and one at 11.30. And at 11.35, a third of the class left. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought, you know, they're just making that up. So I went there, and yes, at 11.35, a third of the class got up and left. And the professor continued to give his mid, anyway. <clears throat> Better use of clickers. Integrate them into lecture. Use them frequently. Don't use clickers unless you're comfortable with them. Uh, require peer instruction. That talking to the neighbors is the, the most important part of the use of clickers. Because you learn by all of us process information using words. And unless you can put it into words, you don't quite have it under control. Mix of difficulties. Some easy concept tests for confidence building and some very difficult ones to get them thinking. Generous credit for any. Answer, I give one point for any answer and two points for the correct answer. And low grade impact. 2% is plenty of, uh, uh, um, what's the word I want, uh, credit to have the students take it seriously. When you're designing concept tests, um, it's a bad concept test if it merely tests recall or blind application of a formula without knowing what the formula means or involves many numbers because the students have to answer in just a few minutes or less. Better concept test is something that tests qualitative understanding I often have the students provide the next step in, uh, in the lecture uh, or use a familiar skill in an unfamiliar context. That's a very good way of testing whether students have mastered. All these just mean you're trying to support a learning goal. OK, how do I make up good concept tests? Well, I ask myself, what are the key points in lecture? And I design a concept test to test that. Uh, if it's a really key point, it's more effective instead of telling the students, ask the students what the key point is and have them generate it. Uh, basically, I'm asking, what's my learning goal? I'm testing that with a concept test. My, <clears throat> my best place for getting uh, concept tests is listening in on student, student conversations in the physics help room. It gives me lots of ideas. But for you, by far, the best way to uh, make up good concept tests is just go to per.colorado.edu and grab a whole library of them for whatever course you're making. We've generated libraries of concept tests for a variety of courses, and you can just download them and use them. Uh, five to ten per lecture. I'll, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll get to the nuts and bolts. Be aware that when you're using a concept test, as soon as you give the answer, that almost entirely stops the discussion among the students. Um, you want to elicit student reasoning before giving the answer. I think it's just as important that students understand why the wrong answer is wrong as why the wrong, right answer is right, because the wrong answer is very tempting. Your job as an educator is to somehow convince the student that you really value reasoning above the answer. 
um, you've got to somehow convince the student that if they understand, they'll get a high exam score. And if they're just memorizing, they'll get a low exam score. Of course, the exams have to be carefully designed uh, to achieve that goal. OK, let me get to the nuts and bolts here. Freshman physics at CU. Um, for our calculus-based physics one, mechanics and thermo, we have 800 students per semester. We only assign two faculty to the 800 uh, um, students. One is the veteran, who is a lecturer, and one is the apprentice, who is doing logistics, uh, managing the TAs, website, grade book, helping answer emails from students. But the most important job of the apprentice is he's watching the veteran, because the apprentice is going to become the primary in the in a subsequent semester. No, uh, we have. Um, we have, our largest classroom is 300 students, so this is a triple lecture. I'm doing it right now. I have to give three lectures every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's the same lecture. I have to write out a script and stick to it. Because I, if, I, if there's a joke, I can't remember whether I told it an hour and five minutes ago or five minutes ago. So I, it's not easy uh, repeating the same lecture three times, but at least I'm done by noon. OK. <clears throat> three lectures, but each lecture is given three times. One recitation per week, so there are four contact hours per week. Um, each lecture is 300 students and one faculty member, but the recitations are uh, 28 students and two TAs. We have a graduate student TA and an undergraduate TA that we call an LA, a learning assistant. In the 50-minute lecture, what do I do? Well, typically, uh, almost always, I have a clicker question running when the students enter the room. It's a review question from last time, or it's a reading quiz question, or it's a survey question. But the point is, I want them to have the clicker out of their pack, turned on, ready to go, so that when I ask that first clicker question, there isn't an explosion of backpack opening. OK. Um, I lecture for maybe a total of 20 minutes in a 50-minute lecture, but I, uh, not continuously. Five or 10-minute chunks, 10 minutes at max. Uh, I spend 30 minutes on typically six or seven concept tests discussion around the concept tests and demonstrations. We require the students to watch a pre-lecture online before the lecture. Um, weekly homeworks are largely traditional, 70% quantitative, hard quantitative multi-step questions, and 30% qualitative questions. But the exams are reversed. The exams are only 40% quantitative, 60% qualitative and conceptual. Students are allowed to bring their own formula sheet to the exam. They can write whatever they like on the formula sheet. The message we're trying to give them is that physics is not about memorizing stuff. If you're afraid of forgetting something, you just write it on your formula sheet and bring it with you. Of course, we know you have a formula sheet, so we're not going to ask you a question like, what's the formula for? All the questions are designed to test whether you understand what the formulas mean and how to use them. Now, almost any quantitative question can be engineered and turn it into a qualitative question. Here's a question that uh, Mazur likes to discuss in his lectures. Um, Eric Mazur, that guy from Harvard who popularized peer instruction. A quantitative question, here's a circuit with resistors, and I tell you the values of the resistance, and I give you the voltage, and I ask, what's the current through one of these resistors? You can turn that into a qualitative question, which students will find harder than the quantitative question. The qualitative question is, when this resistance over here increases, what happens to the current through that resistance over there? That kind of qualitative question uh, invites the student to give up, to engage in qualitative reasoning. This question invites the student to turn off their qualitative reasoning and just plug numbers into a formula. OK, what's this physics help room? Um, all the TAs and most of the faculty hold all their office hours in a big room. Uh, it holds 100 students. There are 25 tables. Uh, it's called the physics help room. The hours are staggered, carefully arranged on a website so that the room is always staffed. Students come in and write their name on the board, and it's first come, first serve. Students hang out here and work on their homeworks. It's been a very successful um, innovation. Okay, the uh, <clears throat> next thing we did, and we did this just about mm, six years ago, was we abolished the traditional graduate student led recitation section. We still have what we call recitation section, but the TAs do not lecture at all in the recitation, and they do not give answers to homework questions. They do not work example problems. What happens in a recitation is the 28 students are in a room with two TAs, one graduate student and one undergraduate student who's acting as a TA. 
Students sit down at a table and work in groups of four, and they work on a set of questions called a tutorial. The tutorials are uh, uh, co are called the Washington tutorials because they're they were created by the PER group, Physics Education Research Group at the University of Washington. So this is what it looks like. Um, the students sit in a table. Uh, that guy right there is actually one of the uh, undergraduate LAs. They're they're working through a set of questions, and the questions are largely qualitative with English sentences as answers. And the engineers initially were very uncomfortable. We got a lot of pushback from students. They didn't like working in groups. They didn't like answering a question that didn't have a numerical answer. And they hated that the TA would answer a question with a question. They, they didn't like that the TA wasn't the answer machine anymore. The group was responsible for providing their own answers. The TA was just there to guide them uh, and uh, make sure they were on task. Um, after a few years, uh, Student, um, what's the word I want? student dissatisfaction evaporated, and um, students don't buy, uh, I don't know if they're happy or unhappy, but they don't complain anymore. <laughs> now, assessment is essential. And by assessment, I don't mean uh, exams that you give grades. Uh, I mean an, a standardized exam that you give to every class year after year to track how much the students are understanding this year compared to how much they understood last year. There are a, a variety of standardized multiple choice exams that we use every time we teach a freshman physics class. For physics one, mechanics, we use uh, either the force concept inventory, FCI, or the FMCE, the force and motion conceptual evaluation. This is a standardized exam, 30 multiple choice questions, all about whether or not the students have internalized conceptual understanding of Newtonian mechanics. For physics two, we use an exam called the BEMA, the Brief Electricity and Magnetism Assessment. It's a very difficult conceptual exam about uh, freshman electricity and magnetism. Very difficult questions. So here are the results from, uh, let's see, this is uh, physics two, phys 1120 in fall of 04. The, we give the exam twice. We give it in the first week in recitation, and we call that the pretest. And then we give the same test again on the last day, the last week of uh, recitation, and then we call that the post test. The blue scores here are the pretest scores. The, the red scores here are the post test scores. Um, the, the graduate student TAs take the pretest, and this is where the average is for the graduate students. It's a hard exam. I didn't get, uh, I think I got a, I got an 84 when I took the exam. Um, what's the, what do these standardized exams look like? They're simple conceptual questions, simple looking to a faculty member anyway. So here's one from the FCI. Uh, an astronaut in intergalactic space is twirling a rock on a string. Suddenly the string breaks when the rock is at the point shown. Which path A, B, C, or D does the rock follow after the string breaks? All the questions, all 30 questions on the FCI force concept inventory are similar to this. They're testing whether or not the student understands Newton's first law, Newton's second law, Newton's third law in a variety of contexts. It's not easy for students. It's easy for faculty. And most, most faculty look at this and say, I'm sorry, this, this exam is just too trivial. It's not trivial for the freshmen because they still have deeply embedded in their hands Aristotelian thinking. Freshmen believe that force causes velocity. They don't understand that force causes acceleration. So <clears throat> uh, what started physics education research, did Matt Sellens show this graph a couple? OK. So here's what started physics education research uh, about 20 years ago. Um, some researchers at the University of Washington developed this force concept inventory and started giving it to lots of students in lots of institutions. And this is the fraction of the courses. and um, this is how well the students did. This is what's called the normalized gain. We measure their post-test score, their pre-test score. Post minus pre is how much their score improved. We divide that by 100 minus pre. That's how much their score could have improved. So the normalized gain is the fraction of what they didn't know coming in that they learned over the course of the semester. The red bars here are a variety of courses in which uh, Traditional instruction is used where the student just, uh, the professor just stands at the blackboard and lectures for 50 minutes. 
Blue bars are courses that used a variety of interactive engagement techniques, clicker questions, concept tests, in-class activities with whiteboards, anything not involving the professor talking at the board. You'll see that the very best traditional instructor couldn't get a gain above 0.26, while uh, interactive engagement techniques um, uh, gave a large spread in gains. Some were much more successful than others. Uh, but um, the worst interactive engagement instructors were as good as the best traditional instructors. So this was evidence, hard evidence, that interactive engagement techniques like clicker questions can improve learning. So this is, uh, for instance, the distribution of results on um, our algebra-based uh, physics one for life science majors. Blue is the pretest scores. Red is the post-test scores. We had a normal ga normalized gain of 0 0.5, 0 0.49. Um, we're routinely getting normalized gain of 0 0.6. The thing to notice about this is the huge spread in post-test scores. Students have a huge variety of backgrounds and uh, motivations in this course, so that translates into a huge a variety, huge spread in learning gains. Okay, so here's the problem on most faculty's mind when they first learn that I'm giving five to ten concept tests every lecture. Good concept tests lead to good class discussion with each in, eats into lecture time. If you eat into lecture time, you can't cover as much. What's the solution? Uh, comments? What's the solution? Longer, Longer classes. <laughs> Talk faster. <laughs> Pre-lecture takes care of it, mm, possibly. Uh, well, <laughs> if you ask the people in the PER community, the solution is stop complaining. This is what you want. This is success. You know, declare victory. Okay, is it? because you've got students engaged as opposed to sitting there. Um, of course, you have to avoid long derivations in lecture. Uh, create homework problems that test knowledge of the derivations. Show detailed derivations online or in the assigned reading. Derive in class only if you're going to make a, te a, a point that's testable with a concept test. In fact, don't do anything at the board unless it's testable with a concept test. You want the students to understand that everything that happens on the board, everything that happens in the class, is going to be tied to a question that they're going to have to answer by discussing with their neighbors. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to give my personal rules of lecture. <laughs> These are the golden rules of lecture, non-scientific, mm, but I have evidence for lots of them if you Okay, rule zero, zeroth rule. Don't reinvent, it's way too much work. Faculty are much more likely to try something new if it does not involve extra work. So, go to per.colorado.edu. Grab the whole library of concept tests, take a look. Uh, rule number one, it is okay to lecture less. It is okay to lecture less. Why? Because they're not listening anyway. <laughs> okay. They're paying attention. They're watching you, they're writing down everything you say, but they're not processing it. They're in scribe mode, which is a restful state of semi-consciousness similar to sleep. <laughs> People learn by doing, not by listening. Funny how piano teachers understand this, foreign language people understand this, kindergarten teachers understand this. Professors training PhD students understand this. Can you imagine some uh, professor saying to his uh, graduate student, watch me while I do research? Okay? It doesn't work that way. You learn by doing. Um, so use concept tests and peer instruction because active learning, active learning works and passive learning doesn't. Lots of demonstrations, but always tied to a concept test. Brief derivations tied to a concept test. Put the lecture notes and everything else on the web uh, to encourage slash enforce reading. We've started the Illinois pre-lectures. Uh, rule two, um, I can't remember rule two, so let me look at it here. Oh yes, kill as few patients as possible. Uh, the, the point here is morale is vital. Um, as I get older and older, I really think that the one of my main jobs as an instructor is to set expectations. Set the bar high and tell them you can do it. Talk to and listen to the students in lecture, in office hours, in the help room. Feedback from the students is essential. That's why the clickers are so valuable. Uh, if they learn something but they leave hating the subject, then we've really failed. 
The common denominator of poor teaching is student-teacher disconnect. The professor looks at the audience but never actually gets feedback from them. Let's see. Rule three, um, emphasize, well, I've said this before, emphasize qualitative reasoning and conceptual understanding in lecture, on homeworks, but especially in the exams. My motto is, I don't care, if, it doesn't matter if they can compute the acceleration if they don't know what acceleration is. Um, now, <clears throat> we've improved learning gains a lot. Um, our learning gains went from 0.25 on these standardized tests, and they're now steadily at 0.6, which is about as high as anywhere in the country. But I don't want you to think that we've performed miracles. Um, students are stubbornly persistent in two incorrect beliefs. Uh, Aristotelian thinking. Everyone believes deep in their hearts that force causes velocity. The other thing, and this is even worse, that students believe is that learning means memorizing. Understanding is different than memorizing. And I'll give you a, a, two examples here. Um, so <clears throat> here's a concept test I gave uh, in lecture. Uh, sailboat is being blown across the sea at constant velocity. What's the direction of the net force on the boat? Uh, what's the correct answer? Uh, net force is zero. <clears throat> now, I had this question in various guises six times during lecture over the course of several weeks. Every time I gave the question, I told the student, told the students, look, <clears throat> this is not a question about a sailboat. It's a question about Newton's first law. There's something moving with constant velocity. That tells you the acceleration is zero. That tells you the net force is zero. You've got to see past the details the surface features to the underlying physics principle involved. And then I warned them, on exam, on every exam, I'm going to put this same question on the exam, but in a slightly different context. So watch for it, OK? It's coming. And they all go, yeah, we're watching for it. When I ask this question in class, post-discussion, correct answer rate is more than 90%. OK, so here was the question on the exam two I just gave last week. Um, Block of mass M is on a flat table being pulled to the right by a string with tension of magnitude Ft. The block is slipping along the table with constant speed V. Coefficient of kinetic friction is mu K. Coefficient of static friction is mu S. As usual, mu S is bigger than mu K. Which of the following statements must be true? <clears throat> so what do you think the correct response rate was? Remember, I had given this concept test six times and had warned them this question was coming. Correct response rate was, what do you think? Uh, uh, no, it's 65% correct, okay? So 35% of them were hit cognitive overload. They, 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 they saw the mu s and the mu k, and they said, oh, oh, this is about mu s and mu k, and it's slipping, so it's mu k. That ate up all their cognitive ability, and the Aristotelian thinking just shined through. And they, uh, those 35% voted that the tension force was bigger than the friction force, when, of course, it's the same. Now, here's another case where don't expect miracles. Um, <clears throat> this was another question on the exam I gave last week. And I'm going to ask this one as a concept test. So listen carefully, because I'm going to ask you the question. Okay? A simple pendulum swings back and forth without friction, as shown, making a maximum angle with the vertical of 45 degrees. Okay? What is the direction of the acceleration of the pendulum mass at the instant that the mass is at the highest point of its swing on the right, as shown in the diagram. Okay, here are the choices, uh, A, B, C, or D, or the acceleration is zero. A and C make 45 degree angles with the vertical. I'm going to start the vote, but I want you to please um, uh, discuss before you vote. Confer with neighbors, please. <clears throat> Stop at five. Uh, we end at five, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'm on time. <clears throat> Pardon? Oh, make sure your clicker is on because it turns itself off after several minutes of inactivity. So hit the power button. Make sure you see the green light when you vote. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Can I have the rest of the votes, please? Okay. <laughs> I will be happily wait for you to all to vote. <clears throat>
Okay. Time's up. Three, two, one. Sorry, I cannot resist the temptation of explaining the answer. <coughs> uh, uh, what I would do in class is elicit reasoning from the audience. Has everyone voted? Can I stop the vote now? Uh, 39 people have voted. Uh, just guess if you don't know by now. Make sure you've got a blue light when you click in, if you don't have a blue light. Okay, got 39 votes, uh, got, so I got uh, nine people abstaining. Okay. All right, I'm stopping the vote now. Okay, so uh, is there any chalk in this room? Yes, there is. Okay. So Fnet is MA, but that won't help because you do not have enough information about the forces in this problem. It's a true equation, but useless in this situation. Okay, acceleration, for those of you who haven't recently taught freshman physics, is the time rate of change of velocity, delta V over delta T. So our job is to figure out the direction of delta V. That's the direction of the acceleration. So on 10 occasions prior to this exam question, I had had concept tests that I called a thing one, thing two, delta thing problem. V1 plus delta V is V2. Got to look at how the velocity is changing in order to get the direction of the change in velocity. Just before the pendulum reaches the top, it's heading upward. That's the V1. Just after it reaches the top, it's heading in the other direction, downward. That's the V2. What delta V do I have to vector add to V1 in order to get V2? That delta V. The correct answer is, what's the correct answer? C. Let's see how you did here. A little nervousness in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy question. Sixty-nine percent. Better than my students, okay? Now, <clears throat> in fact, so, so I do this every year. Uh, every year I teach freshman physics one. Again, I give them a V1, V2, delta V problem in a variety of contexts, and I warn them that on the exam, I'm going to give you a V1, V2, delta V problem, but it'll be in a context slightly different than the one you've seen before, and can you all please remember the strategy? And uh, usually, I get uh, about 70% correct, just about this, uh, just about the same as this audience. But this semester, I got 35% correct. I was just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I I'm degrading. I'm not as effective as I was last year. So <clears throat> I looked at their exams to see what their reasoning was, and I saw what the problem was right away. The problem was that there was an, a, a homework question just the week before. There, yeah, there was a homework question which was similar. It involved a pendulum swinging back and forth. And on the homework question, they were asked the direction of the acceleration at various points, but not at the end point. They were asked here, here, and here. And the acceleration does this at these points. That was the correct answer. Uh, the, the problem didn't ask them what the acceleration up here was. Almost everyone who voted wrong voted B, and they drew this diagram on their exam. They were simply remembering the answer from a different question the week before. <clears throat> if they think they memorize the answer, their, their higher thinking skills just shut down. You know, students are absolutely convinced that memory is the most re re reliable way of answering any question on any exam. And breaking them of that habit is very hard. OK, let's see. Five minutes left, no problem. OK, um, so it's a hard exam. Here are the distribution of scores for exam number two. Average was 66. Big spread in skills. That four is, is not a mistake. <laughs> Student actually got a four. He didn't. We, we have a couple different versions of the exam with different answer keys so that you know they, it's harder to copy from each other. But the distractors are carefully chosen by the PER group. And oh, this guy just found all the distractors. Okay, now, you'll have to invite me back if you want a question about clicker use in upper division courses. Here is a plot of all of our upper division courses 
uh, math methods. Uh, we combine our classical mechanics and math methods into uh, a two-semester sequence. ENM1, ENM2, quantum one, quantum two, stat max, solid state, plasma, nuclear, high energy. These last three courses we only offer every other semester. That's why some of them are blanked out. Checkbox is uh, showing the semester when the professor teaching the course used uh, clickers. And you can see most of the courses now use clickers. What happened was some member of the PER group, usually uh, Steve Pollock or me, would teach the course, develop a library of concept tests, and pass it on to the next person. You can get all those libraries on per.colorado.edu. So just for fun, um, let me have one more concept test. This is a concept test from uh, a senior level course, Thermo and Statmec. Make sure you discuss this with your neighbors before voting. So here we go. An unopened bottle of champagne, champagne, equipped with a pressure gauge, has been sitting on the shelf for a long time. The bottle is given a brief, vigorous shake. <laughs> What happens to the pressure in the bottle? Uh, comment. A brief shake will raise the temperature less than 0.01 degrees centigrade. Um, a, the pressure remains unchanged, as read by the gauge. Uh, B, the pressure falls significantly. C, the pressure rises significantly. Now, it's not enough to have the right answer. You've got to have the right answer with the right reason. So I'm going to start the vote, but before you vote, do that peer instruction thing. Confer with neighbors and try and come up with a reason for your answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can tell you right now, none of the choices, none of the choices has a majority right now. Please make sure your clicker light is on. Make sure the power light's on. And then vote. Oops, sorry. That's not it. Okay. Okay, we've got all the votes. Uh, again, only 39 people voting. Some, some people have left. Is that the idea? <laughs> but they, they didn't take their clicker. <laughs> okay, so time's up. Uh, you know, when you vote, you get a green light. Okay, time's up. Three, two, one. Okay, I can see the results. And, uh, well, let me show you here. It's, uh, it's a split between A and C. Is there someone so confident of their team's reasoning that they're willing to share their answer with us? Uh. <laughs> 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 Thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, what was that? When I, when I shake it, it'll go out of equilibrium? Right, right. So it rises significantly. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. right. So, and as a more sophisticated reason, mm -hmm. thinking afterward, I said to myself, okay, it's probably easier for the gas to come out than to get out of the fluid, uh -huh. than to get into the, uh, go from the, uh, the uh -huh. right. Factor. So, sorry, you're voting which? C. C, okay. And... And you say, when you shake it, uh, it goes out of equilibrium. So this is interesting. Uh, when it's in equilibrium, the entropy is maximum. So you're saying when you shake it, the entropy goes down. Did I say that? 
I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I won't further embarrass you, except to say that uh, when I first did this question at a physics colloquium at CU, that ended the colloquium because people started shouting at each other. <laughs> people started, people started yelling at each other over the reasoning. Uh, but um, let me tell you, the uh, the answer was slyly embedded in the question itself. Watch the pressure gauge. It doesn't move. <laughs> in fact, uh, when I uh, often when I do this. I actually bring a bottle of soda water with a pressure gauge, and I shake it, and you can shake it as hard as you want. That needle will not budge. If it's in equilibrium, shaking it does not drive it out of equilibrium. That would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So if it's in equilibrium, it stays in equilibrium when you shake it, and the pressure doesn't change. The question everyone has is, well, why does shaking it affect the future? Uh, you know, when I pull, uncork it, if I shake it, it's much more likely to go... <laughs> Anyone have a... Even though I haven't changed the pressure, it's already at high pressure before I shook it. It was about at two atmospheres. It was under pressure. And when I shake it, it stays at two atmospheres. So what's the difference between shake? Why does the stuff spritz out? I'm going to let you think about that for later. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm out of time here, so let me just skip right to the end here. Transform that s transforms that stick. Necessary conditions. Strong support from the top. Having a couple Nobel Prize winners who pushed physics education research, having a couple chairs who valued this, uh, having a faculty that was willing to go along with the creation of physics education research group, uh, that was essential. Having a physics education group which prepared a lot of materials for other faculty to use was essential. Hard work from the bottom and acceptance from the middle. The rest of the faculty had to be on board. So to get acceptance from the middle, it was important to never pressure faculty. Faculty are chosen for their independence of spirit. You can't tell a physics faculty member to do something that they're not comfortable with. So you build consensus before uh, instituting any changes. Respect traditional lectures. We have superb traditional lectures in our department. We do not require anybody to use clickers. Uh, People don't disagree with their own ideas is uh, a, a phrase I picked up from Gary Gladding from the University of Illinois. Um, they'll use clickers if they want to. Train new faculty as they arrive. This was the main way that we transformed the department over a long period of time, taking the assistant professors and giving them all the, um, all the tools they needed. Provide complete resources for receptive faculty. Collect evidence that transforms, improve learning. It's supposed to be a science. We need evidence that things are getting better, not worse. Even though people may feel more uncomfortable, we have to be able to point to learning gains. Reforms stick if they're only if they're seen as valuable by students and faculty alike. OK, I've got to end with a joke. Two-way conversations with students are vital. Uh, Mouse is asking Pig, if you could have a conversation with one person, living or dead, who would it be? <laughs> Two-way conversations are vital because it's amazing how students can misinterpret what you say. Unless you have a conversation, you can't tell that the communication is happening the way you want. OK, one more thing. Contest test libraries, as well as old exams, uh, modified homework, in-class tutorial activities are available at per.colorado.edu. Uh, you don't need the CTL, sorry. Just go per.colorado.edu. Uh, CTL gets you to the concept test libraries. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I ran over. <laughs> <laughs> CU, uh, CU, Colorado Supreme Court just overturned a ban of guns on campus at CU. Students are now allowed to carry concealed weapons on campus. Yeah, yeah. Question, sir. Yeah. You mentioned that you allow the students to bring formula sheets. 
Correct. On try not to allow the citizens to have permit of freedom. Here's what the good. What level they understand the material and give them more time for the exam. Ah, more time for the exam. That's an interesting point. Their questions and. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, no, I have not tried uh, giving the same exam to a similar group without a formula sheet. Uh, I do the formula sheet for several reasons. It relieves them of stress, and also the preparation of the formula sheet is in itself a valuable exercise, I believe. One of the rules is it has to be a handwritten formula sheet. They may not Xerox, and they may not uh, type. It has to be handwritten. All the good students report to me that they spent hours preparing their formula sheet and then never looked at it during the exam. That's exactly what we want. Um, let's see, your other point was, uh, sorry, what was the other point? Uh, no, if you are, if you them to the oh, oh the, sorry, the other thing was more time. More time. It, exactly. So we have a 25 question multiple choice exam. It's 100% multiple choice because we have 800 students. We don't have the person power to grade long answer questions. About 10% of the students uh, still remain when the 90 minutes is up. It pains me to see those 10% students who might still be thinking. But, you know, time's up. I'd like to give them more time. I think maybe we might. Yeah, in the the yeah that's right. Reduce the question by one, but, you know, that's elastic. Uh, it's hard to, if there are fewer questions, it's hard not to unconsciously make the remaining questions harder. <laughs> the exam is, they're always evening exams. Uh, uh, we have to seat them in, uh, we seat them every other seat during the exam, and we have two versions of the exam so that they're a long way from their version. Uh, making it a little harder to copy. Yeah, well, <laughs> we have an extra layer. We, we have two versions of the exam, but four different colors. And they don't know which of the four colors <laughs> are the same. So we we tried. Yeah, it's it's physically possible to te teach by, cheat by leaning up a little bit and glancing over. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the TAs are in the room. Lies. Yeah, way in the back. Mm -hmm. well, oh, sorry, huge increase over traditional instruction. We, uh, I don't have data to show you uh, changing only uh, pre-lectures. So I don't think I can show you data showing that a pre-lecture by itself being the only change has a measurable effect on our learning gains. Um, none of the students complain about the pre-lectures. The only feedback we get from the students about pre-lectures is positive, so they do like them. Now, whether that improves learning, I uh, don't have data on that yet. Yeah, they must be using some standardized questions that they reuse every year. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's I couldn't agree more. So I, you know, I tell the students, you're going to forget, you know, unless you're a physics major, you're going to forget all these formulas. What I'm trying to train you is how to think, you know, see past the details to the underlying big ideas. Ask yourself, how do I derive the answer, not how do I remember the answer? How do I go back to fundamentals? The, the, so all I can say is, I certainly agree with you. I push that, but we have no way of measuring what they know in five years. We do do a longitudinal study about their attitudes. We track our freshmen up through the senior year about what their thinking is about learning and science. We don't ask them questions about physics. We ask them questions about learning and science. It's called the, the CLAS, the Colorado Learning About Attitudes in Science Survey. <laughs> anyway, but that's another story. Yeah, and your second point? Oh, absolutely. There are there are quantitative questions on the exams. It was only 60% conceptual. There are uh, lots of hard quantitative questions on the uh, homeworks. So you bet. These are engineers, and they love those questions. They all report that those are the easy questions. Give me more of those, please. 
the, uh, my favorite comment from the student was, I hate the conceptual questions because I have to think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, why this strange method? Well, it evolved adiabatically in a... So we're not satisfied with the current situation. So uh, three years ago, we had 600 students. A year ago, we had 700 students. Now we have 800. This, in fact, was the first semester where we're having to give, we've, we're having, to give a triple lecture. Up till this semester, it's been a double lecture. We, we've just uh, come to an agreement with the dean. If someone teaches a triple lecture, it's regarded as a teaching overload, and they get the following semester off. We discussed with the faculty, what do we do about this triple lecture? And the consensus was nobody wanted to have to coordinate its common exams. And no one wanted to have to coordinate their lectures with another person. You know, if it's common exams, you've got to make sure the lectures track exactly, cover exactly the same material, same concept test. Otherwise, someone might be at a disadvantage. I agree. If we do go to a quadruple lecture, which I think will happen in about two years, then we are definitely going to split it up into four faculty. Two lectures, two faculty members each, total of four faculty. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we ourselves are struggling with the best way to uh, attack this problem with personnel. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh. Yes. So, so, so what I, so what I, what I mean by plan is I plan what I'm going to write on the board, so I don't write too much, and I plan where in the lecture the concept tests are going to be. But of course, I can't predict ahead of time how much uh, whether it's going to be a great concept test with a 50-50 split, in which case. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, the thing about uh, 250 students is they are statistically significant. They, I get the same response rate for those three lectures. So I can tell from the first lecture how it's going to go, and then I, I change the script. It's, it's okay for me to change the script, but then I stick to the script for lectures two and three because it, it almost never happens that there's a significantly different vote in the second and third lecture than the first lecture because there's a couple hundred of them. And so you have enough, you have enough oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we have, in fact, on, online, uh, we publish the lecture notes before the lecture, but we don't publish the clicker questions until after the lecture. And in fact, we have way more clicker questions than we have time to in lecture. So we tell the students, make sure you check the clicker question solutions, because there are extra clicker questions that will help you prepare for the exam. So if I run short of time, I just leave clicker questions off. We do. Yeah, the question is, do we still use a fixed textbook since we provide all these other resources? We still do. I personally do because I believe it's important that an engineer or a physics major build up a library of textbooks over the course of their career. However, starting two years ago, I made the textbook optional rather than required. We essentially have a textbook on the website. It's my lecture notes, which are now complete enough that they're essentially a pared-down textbook. 
we've done a lot of studies of student reading habits. Only about 10% of the students do what I did. Namely, you read the book carefully before the lecture, 10%. For those 10%, I want to be sure to choose a really good book. So we put some care. We use Wolfson, Central University of Physics. When the book was required two years ago, 90% of the students purchased the book. Now that the student is, now that the textbook is optional, 50% of the students purchased the book. So that's where we are with the textbook. That, that was the terrifying thing about our study. There was no clear correlation between the quality of the reading habits and the final grade. Uh, some students who read the book, who self-reported that they read the book carefully, did poorly, and vice versa. Physics help room, yeah, that's totally separate from the recitation. We tell the students, if you have a question about a homework problem, you go to the help room. You don't do that in recitation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ah, what about labs? Thank you. Um, at the engineer's insistence, we separated the lab course from the lecture. So we have a separate laboratory course. One credit hour. One credit hour that they... This is four credit hours, four credit hour lecture. So there's only, a, actually, it's four, four, and one. So they take the one credit hour freshman lab concurrently with the second semester. What I love about Washington tutorials is it's allowed us to sneak the lab back in because many of the Washington tutorials use equipment. And as long as we don't call it a lab, call it a recitation, uh, uh, Funny thing is that uh, it was the electrical engineers who 20 years ago asked us to peel the lab off from the lecture because the electrical engineers wanted to teach their own lab. They didn't like us teaching them about pendulums and, and uh, black body sources. They wanted to just teach them about circuits. Okay? Uh, about three years ago, the engineers came back and said, oh, okay, I think you guys do a better job teaching freshman uh, lab than we do. So we're now requiring the engineers to take freshman lab. So the answer is it's a separate course. Yeah, sir. Majors, right, right. Are they all repeated? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, the answer is uh, no. But you know, when I say triple, I mean both the incoming and outgoing is tripled. We've got attrition. It's the same loss, it's the same loss rate, right? We we have. I don't know what fraction. See, the problem is both numbers. It's a moving target. You know, both numbers are doing. Sorry. Yeah, I, both numbers are doing this. But what I should, what we should really do is for a four-year cohort, track how many make it through to the end. I don't have that statistic. Sorry. Yes. Yes. On the homeworks, right, mm -hmm. right. So do you find, or have you done any, anything about this, that if the students have a better conceptual understanding, they perform better on quantitative? That's a fascinating question. Does, does training in conceptual understanding improve or degrade performance on quantitative questions? There have been a couple of studies to that end, and all with inconclusive results. So all I can tell you is there is no evidence that emphasizing conceptual understanding hurts their ability <laughs> <laughs> to work to work multi-step quantitative problems. My own feeling is, again, if they can compute acceleration but they don't know what acceleration is, I think that's a step backward. They're somehow fooling themselves that they've learned something when, <laughs> when they don't know what the heck they're doing with these symbols. So excellent question. I don't know the answer. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, return the clickers, please. Very good question for you. Yes.